some seats in the back of the room and, and off to the side here. Um, so how'd the homework go? Yeah? Did, did, did you guys like it? Any questions about it? What? No, I mean, I misread a number and globbed up a problem. I see. Yeah, so we're, we're letting you, so, so we tried to, to avoid that. We had, we had these warm-ups and then the, the final problems. We're changing it to two tries on this week's homework. Um, it's going to come out right after class. So, so you had three tries last time. This time on the on the homework, you only have two. The warm up, as as before, you have infinitely many tries. So you can just make sure that you understand before you actually get assessed. Um, all right. Any questions about the project? How's the project going? Fine. Fine. Good. Anybody have a problem they want to talk about or a story? Something about the project? No? You all looked at it last week, right? Who's done with the project? No one. One person. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right, so, so well, there's TA hours. And um, the other thing I wanted to actually ask, we had a bunch of posts. Um, and we, there's, there's sort of different ways to ask for help in the course. And one of the ways that, that hasn't really been used, but which I'd like to try using, is the discussion forum on the course website. So you have the TA mailing list. You have um, our, e our individual emails. Hi, guys. There's seats in the back and over here. Um, and, and you have each other, and you have TA hours. But I really want to encourage you, if you're sending a question about one of the problem sets to the TA mailing list, consider posting it instead on the discussion forum. So we have TAs monitoring the discussion forum and answering questions there. And what that'll do is, is, if, is sort of let you guys share the questions and answers. So you can see if somebody else has already asked that question, and that might help sort of build a, a knowledge base about uh, what's going on. You can also feel free to answer somebody else's question on the discussion forum. The TAs will kind of check that every, we'll, we'll be moderating it. But um, I think these kinds of peer-to-peer -peer interactions can be really valuable. It's, it's sort of the re one, one, one major advantage to taking this course all together <laughs> Um, in a big group as opposed to you know, going online on Audacity or, or something else and, and, or reading the textbook on your own. You have each other. So I'm trying to experiment with ways to facilitate these kinds of peer-to-peer -peer interactions. Um, we're also, um, in, the, in the next week or so, we're going to introduce a new kind of assignment where you actually get to post on the discussion forum and then answer somebody else's post in, in a more structured way. But we'll talk, we'll talk about that more next week. All right, guys. So the topic for today, um, for this week really, is local search algorithms. And we touched on them a little bit last week, uh, but we're going to dig, dig into them in more details uh, in this class and, and in the next class. Uh, but before we do that, I kind of felt like we, we uh, glossed over a, te a technical point about heuristics last week that is, is important. And maybe you guys have it now from, from the homeworks, but I thought it would be useful to go over it in, in lecture uh, as well. So. Um, so I guess I wanted to, first of all, pull up the, this algorithm from the beginning and, and kind of look at it again after having gone through our, our search algorithms, right? So we've talked about all actions um, and how, we're, how we have these different informed and uninformed search algorithms that help us um, figure out what order to traverse the space of actions. So, so this is, this is, you can kind of see this as an oversimplification. And in, in what way is, is all actions an oversimplification? What's one way? Yeah? Well, most times we don't actually want to enumerate all possible actions. Yeah, we don't want to enumerate all possible actions. When we do enumerate all possible actions, what's that called? Exhaustive search. Exhaustive search, uninformed search. OK, so breadthford search and depthford search. And they were just switching the order. But when we don't want to enumerate all possible actions, then we have what, what kinds of search? What kind of search? Informed. Informed search, yeah. So we have A star and, and our heuristics. And so far, we haven't really talked very much about the scoring function. It's been our cost function, and it's basically given to us uh, as part of the problem statement. The heuristic is a little bit, um, is, 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 is sort of one version of, of where this scoring function com uh, comes from. But we've basically been making it up. Uh, you know, out of, our, out of our intuitions about how the problem works. So what we're going to talk about today uh, is a little bit more formally about what it means for your heuristic to be a good scoring function. And then we're going to talk, when we talk about local search algorithms, in particular we're going to talk about simulated annealing 
And, and we're going to think about how uh, we can formalize that score as, in terms of a probability, and it'll help us move around the search space. Um, but this is an oversimplification. So we're missing, there's, a, there's bookkeeping that was happening in breadth first search and depth first search in A star that we're not, that's just not in this, this algorithm. Um, at the same time, I think this conception is kind of useful to keep touching back on because what a lot of AI is, is tricks to make this work. So what we're learning and, and what I'm trying to, to, to show you guys is like a toolbox of different tricks so that you can do some version of this algorithm, some approximation of what this algorithm is trying to do, but in an efficient way. So we talked about breadth first and depth first search, and then we talked about the trick of using A star so that we can efficiently search through the space. And, and now we're this, this class, we're going to talk about local search algorithms, greedy algorithms, simulating annealing. Again, so we can efficiently um, figure out ways to, to make this um, general approach tractable. And by the end of the course, you're going to have a pretty big toolbox, and hopefully we'll t we'll, you'll have a, a sense of different ways to apply the tricks in order to solve useful problems. OK, so there were two, there's sort of um, two formal concepts about heuristics from the book that I kind of glossed over last time. So the first was admissible, and, and the second is consistent. Um, and these are mathematical properties of a heuristic function that, if it's true, um, translates into guarantees about optimality of A star if it's using the, the heuristic. So does anybody um, know what, want to tell me what an admissible heuristic is from the book or from the problem set, from the, from the homework project? Yeah. It's one where um, the guess, uh, the sort of heuristic value will never be than the yeah, value. we're never going to overestimate yeah. the goal. And I always screw it up, like overestimate, underestimate. Um, so, so like when you when you implement these algorithms, like that that sign is the biggest thing. What's a consistent heuristic? So here's uh, admissible. One where it's never less than. Yeah. Um, if you if the cost to move to that node is c, the mm -hmm. drop in the heuristic value will never be more than c. Yeah. So this is uh, this is the math of that. So, so what this is saying, this is, this is saying the heuristic function is always going to be less than the true cost of moving from a new node plus the heuristic function at that node. So consistent is a relation between the heuristic function at this node and the heuristic function at all the other nodes. So it's sort of saying that the heuristic function has to kind of be consistent across the entire space of, of problems intuitively. And then in math, this is sort of the, the formalization of that. So, th so I think the best way to think about these is, is to come up with some examples and, and figure out what they are. So let's go back to the eight puzzle um, from last time. And these are the same two heuristics that we had before. So why don't we make a little table of heuristics and come up with some that are admissible and not consistent, consistent and not admissible. I guess they'll have to be. Consistent if they're admissible. So, admiss so consistent is a stronger condition than admissibility. So every consistent heuristic is admissible. Um, but, but every admissible heuristic is not consistent. So let's take, um, so let's see. So let's write down not admissible or Consistent, admissible, and consistent. So everything that's consistent is also admissible. So let's take these two heuristics. So H1, the total number of misplaced tiles. So, so everybody try to think, is this one, which um, we're going to basically put these heuristics in, in each one of these columns. So which column do you think the H1 heuristic should be in? Is it not admissible or consistent? Is it admissible but not consistent? Or is it consistent? OK, we're going to do a vote. So how many think it should be in column one? How many think it should be in column two? Raise your hand. How many people think it should be in column three? Yeah, I think it's a consistent heuristic. It's actually, so, so, so even though it's not the best possible, I'm going to write down actually, H1. So if you guys remember from last time, 
um, the, the H2 heuristic is giving us more information in some sense about the goal. But it's still not going to overestimate. It's going to tell us that the total number of misplaced tiles from one configuration to the next configuration is, is telling us sort of consistent information about the problem. It's going to, it's going to consistently tell you that, that um, a problem is better, uh, sort of one state is better than, than another state. Um, so now let's try to come up with a heuristic, uh, a new heuristic for this problem that is not, that is admissible but not consistent. This is tricky. This is hard to do. So somebody shout, shout one out when you, if you have an idea for how to do this. Yeah. The Euclidean distance. If you could go diagonally. Um, so let's see, H, so Euclidean distance. So I think Euclidean distance is still admissible and consistent because it's telling you sort of for, for each state, it, it, it's, it's sort of related to, to Manhattan distance um, um, in terms of how far away things are from the goal. Yeah. Yeah, you're getting closer. So, so what? Let's let's that's that's sort of the well, the path to the one that I that I thought of. Um, so, if, let's just say it's the distance between tile two and the correct position of tile two. So, do you guys think that one is a it, is a better sort of in terms of telling us good information about the problem? Is it good or is it is it is it um, giving us more information than H one or H two or less information? Probably less information. But I think it's still consistent because it's telling us, so, so if we look at our, at our cost function, um, it, it, here our cost is just the cost of, of the number of different moves. So if, if we're moving our tile to, then, then it's going to be, um, then our heuristic function is going to be lower. But if we don't move tile to in, our, in this move here, it's going to be equal and it's still okay. It's less than or equal to. So it won't actually, if we don't move tile to, our heuristic value is not going to change. So it's not going to really, it's not going to, it's not going to help us very much if we don't move tile two. It's like if we're considering moves that don't involve moving tile two, our heuristic isn't going to give us useful information, but it's not going to lie to us either. Um, but there is a way to kind of make it lie to you, or not, not exactly lie to you, but it's going to, um, uh, so uh, which is related to this idea. So so um, so here's here's a version of that: the total Manhattan distance of blocks one, two, and three. Um, and, as, and as we said, so, so this is little, oh, three blocks instead of just block two. Um, oh, the way to make a consistent but inadmissible heuristic is to insert a little bit of randomness here. So here's a heuristic function. With probability 0.6, we're going to return the total Manhattan distance of blocks one, two, and three. Um, should be four to eight. And at probability 0.4, we're going to flip a coin. And with probability 0.4, we're going to return the total Manhattan distance of blocks four to eight. Sorry, it's supposed to be eight instead of nine. So now it's admissible because we're always going to overestimate. Just like the, this Manhattan distance thing overestimated, this is also going to overestimate the goal. But it's not consistent because at different nodes, we don't know whether we're going to be getting one, two, and three, or, or four, five, six, and seven, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So if we go back to our consistent, this, and th this inequality is going to be violated. So, so, um, so that's a counter. So, so that's an example of heuristics that are of one heuristic for this problem, that is admissible and not consistent. Does that make sense? It's kind of hard to come up with these examples. So, so, it, and, it, and it, it was I was I was kind of I had to actually go on Stack Overflow to find this one, um, for for the eight puzzle. So, it but it's important to keep it in mind. Because a lot of what you guys do when you apply these problems is you're I inventing heuristics and, and comparing different heuristics. So we have this terminology um, and these concepts in place so that you guys can sort of think about whether one heuristic that you came up with is better or worse or the same as another heuristic without actually having to go off and implement it. Although at the end of the day, implementing is, is sort of the test. But, but you want to be able to sort of, um, in your head, be able to have some kind of intuition about what heuristics might be good or, or bad for a particular problem. So, um, so what I'd like to do now is have you guys sort of turn to each other 
And we, we've done in the, in, the, in the past couple of classes, we, you've sort of come up with a problem and we've talked about different information that's going to help you uh, do better at solving the problem. So I'd like you to turn to each other and pick uh, either the same problem as last time or a different problem um, and come up with a heuristic for that problem. And then tell me whether it's, an, come, up, come up with a good heuristic, a, a, a heuristic you think is pretty good and a heuristic you think is not so good. And then, at the, and then when we come back, we're, um, we're, gonna at, we're gonna ask you to tell me the problem and the good heuristic and the bad heuristic. And, and tell me why you think it's better or worse. So why don't you guys turn to each other now for two minutes. <laughs> About 30 more seconds. All right, guys. All right, guys, why don't we come back? Finish up. All right, so does anybody want to share with the class a brief description of your problem and then a good heuristic and a bad heuristic and why you think the good heuristic is better than the bad heuristic? Yeah. Um, I would just get from the top of, get from somewhere on a ski slope to the lodge. Mm -hmm. And a good heuristic would be like distance down the hill, like distance towards, like distance from mm -hmm. the uh, large straight line. A bad one would be like mm -hmm. the gradient of the slope. Sort of like it would be based on how steep, a, bad, a worse one would be just the steepness of the slope that you're going down. Gradient of slope and steepness. I mean, they're like the same thing. Yeah. Well, so gradient, I guess, would just be direction. So if it was pointing towards the lodge, where oh, steepness would just be how like down we're going. How steep yeah. It is, sort of. Yeah. So do you think that distance to the lodge is which, which column does that one go in? Um, it goes in like both of them, I think. Missable and consistent. I'll say admissible. Yeah. Missable. Oh, sorry. And consistent. So I put our, the ones from the eight problem there too. So, so distance to large is over here. Yeah. So what about steepness? I think that would just be consistent, but not really admissible. I don't think it could be, it could be admissible, but it can't really be consistent because you could have mm -hmm. the steepest cliff, which mm -hmm. is just jumping off the cliff in the opposite direction of the lodge. Mm -hmm. It doesn't actually. Yeah, I think it depends on our ski resort, like whether we have, like where we have two mountains, you can go down the backside to another lodge yeah. uh, right. versus, yeah, yeah. versus so not. Well, I mean, yeah. assuming you're like heading towards points, just yeah, like 
the steepness doesn't really correlate to the actual goal. So going towards steeper places doesn't actually, yeah. the cost of walking that distance doesn't actually give you any benefit. Yeah, I think it might not even be admissible. Do you? Okay. Well, I guess it depends on. Because you could come up with a case where it's going gonna, it's gonna to point you completely in the wrong direction. So it might, like, like if you're just looking at the raw steepness of the, of the hill, like I could have an arbitrarily steep or shallow yeah, hill like in you show, in any show direction I wanted in, in, in this in kind of, in a terrain park, there you go, yeah, so you're. Yeah. <laughs> if we change the problem to instead just be get to the bottom of it, then I think yeah. it would be admissible but not consistent. Yeah, so if you have um, a, 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 a ski s with no terrain parks, right, so if you're not a snowboarder, <laughs> And you're just going to go, so you're on the bunny hill, let's say. Let's just limit ourselves to there. Then probably going down in the direction of steepest descent would be admis admissible, but not consistent. Yeah, good. Um, so I'll put gradient. We'll kind of put it halfway in between, because it depends on, on which ski resort you're at. Um, somebody else? Yeah. <coughs> uh, try, <coughs> trying to solve a maze uh, okay. by you know, starting at start going through the position. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> okay, yes, yeah, so, so, so the good one is the Manhattan distance to the goal, and I, and I, I agree with that. It's, it's similar to the, to the ones we were using for A-star and the 2D distance. I think it's admissible and consistent. Um, randomly choose, so I think this is admissible but not... Yeah, it'd be admissible but not consistent. Not consistent, yeah. Because it would always underestimate. Randomly choose between... Zero and Manhattan distance to the goal. So, so this you guys laughed when when um, he came up with this example, but it's actually a pretty interesting situation that that happens in real life and sometimes. So, so if you imagine that you've got a sensor, if you're a robot going through this maze, and you have a sensor that tells you something about the environment, maybe it tells you where you are in the environment, but sometimes the sensor screws up. So um, it might not return zero, but it might tell. It might return zero. I mean, like if, for example, we have a sensor on our cell phones, all of us, which are which is called GPS, right? And it tells us where we are in the world, and that can be a really useful thing to get through, get to get from like you know from from somewhere in Providence to somewhere in Boston, for example. But what happens when you go down the big dig in Boston underneath underground? What happens to your cell phone? Who's ever searching for signal? Searching for signal, yeah. Or if you drive over, if you drive down Route 90, I live in Rochester, so I drive down Route 90 past Albany to upstate New York. If you go through the, the Berkshires, when you're going through the mountains over there, all the time your, your cell phone GPS signal is, is conked out and you can't find it. So it actually looks quite a bit like this situation, right? It tells me, I mean, so one way to model it is to say, well, it's going to tell me nothing or it's going to tell me the, the true estimate of the distance to the goal. So, so it's, uh, it's, an interesting, it's interesting that you came up with that because it's um, sort of a, a situation that we, we want to be able to handle in, uh, in real life as we make these problems more, real, more realistic. All right, so, um, so now we're going to um, switch gears a little bit and talk about local search algorithms. So this is a robot. And one of the um, things I wanted to do in this class is, is not just talk about these sort of toy problems. So we're doing a, a lot of our examples are things like the in your homeworks you guys are doing the the uh, four queen the the n queens problem where you're, you're, it's like this chessboard and we did the eight puzzle um, we did the maps and I think the maps kind of feel a little bit more realistic. Um, I wanted to, to, to say a little bit about like why we do these these toy problems, which is what a lot of people in AI call them, and the reason is that they kind of get at the essential of the algorithm. It's easy to explain. It's easy to formalize. It's easy to understand the problem, and you can kind of try out the algorithm without worrying about the complexities of, of what it takes to do it in a real-world problem. But I also want to have you guys thinking about how these, these algorithms apply to real-world problems. That's the point of, of what we're doing. So even though we use these toy problems for pedagogical reasons to try to explain how the algorithm is working, uh, it's important to think about the connection to, to the real world. And partly we're doing with these seat exercises, we can think about how to apply them to other problems, partly through the projects we're doing, um, projects and, and localization stuff, and partly in lecture, 
we're, we'll be talking today about, about real world applications of these kinds of local search algorithms. So this is, um, and one, one other thing that we're doing, and I'll talk more about this at the end of class, is next class, we're actually, this is the class for Thursday, we're going to switch gears a little bit. We're going to read a research paper. So um, it's already posted on the schedule, and we'll post a little announcement on the course website. So you can actually see how these algorithms um, are used and how these techniques are used in, in modern day computer science research to do cool stuff. Um, so one example of why people use search, in particular why people use the local search algorithms that we're going to talk about today, is to do planning for a robot. So we've talked about path planning already, where, where we have little zerglings walking around in StarCraft and trying not to hit things. And a bunch of you guys have come up with like maze examples and, and ski slope examples where we're zipping down the hill. It turns out that when you have a, a robot, this is the PR2, with like all of these joints on its arms, moving, figuring out where, like, and we, let's say we want to pick up the cup with both of our arms, we want to pick it up like that. Figuring out where we should move our arms, what commands we should send to all of our joint angles here, is a pretty hard problem. And it's pretty hard to come up with good heuristics for that problem. So, um, and, and the reason is that the space of possible motions is really big. So we're not just searching for like where we want the hand to be at the end. We kind of know like we want it to be kind of close to the cup and we want to achieve forced closure around the cup. We want to pick it up like this and we have the robot do it. Um, but what we don't really know <laughs> is over time what joint angles should each of these joints be at. And, if, um, and this robot, I think it's an like eight degree of freedom on each arm robot. So that's like eight joint angles that we have to specify at each time step in order to, in the end of the day, get the robot um, grasping the arm. And the way that people solve these algorithms is, is ver more complicated versions of these kinds of local search. So this is an example of, uh, of an RRT, a rapidly exploring random tree. It's in 2D space, and of course we know how to do 2D space better um, with our A star uh, that we learned the other day. But like, in, and this is a picture of an RRT in a, in a more complicated 3D space, and, and, an eight, and the advantage of these kinds of algorithms is, is that it gives you solutions in much higher dimensional spaces, um, for example, in our robot path planning algorithm, then, uh, where we can't really come up with a good heuristic uh, that, uh, compared to the exhaustive search algorithms or the un uninformed search algorithms. Okay? So, so this is kind of giving you an intuition behind what we're going to do. Um, so the other sort of thing to think about with the local search algorithms, and this is a, a question that came up in class last time, why do, uh, you know, what, why do we want the path to the goal? So does anybody want to, to answer that question? What, what, in, in our path planning algorithms, in our, in our map algorithms, why do we want the path to the goal? What are we going to use it for? Yeah. For yeah. Right. So we're just going to tell our little zergling to go from this point to this point to this point to actually, um, actually follow that trajectory. Do we always want the path to the goal? I'm trying to spread the, the, well, so some of you are raising your hands, and you're the people who always raise your hands, and I'm looking for people who don't always raise your hands. So I really appreciate the people who are raising your hands a lot. I don't want to, I want you to keep doing that, but don't be sad if I'm not calling on you, because I think um, it's important for all of you guys to, to be participating in, in terms of what's going on in the class. So somebody who hasn't raised their, somebody who hasn't yet answered a question. Do we always want the path to the goal? One's an ex what, uh, do we always want the path to the goal? So yes or no question, so it's easy. Have you, answer, have you, have you raised your hand before in class? Yeah, ever. <laughs> okay, somebody who's never raised their hand before. Else, else I'll call on you. Yeah. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that would be great, yeah. Uh, I'm thinking like the, the queen problem. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so guess what my next slide is? The queen problem. Yeah, so, so yeah, there's some problems where we don't need the path to the goal. We don't care like what states we went to in order to get to the goal. We just need the answer um, in, in terms of which trajectories we're, we're going to find. And this is another, this is sort of another situation where local search can really help you because you don't care, in, like, like if you don't care what the trajectory is, you also don't really care if it's the optimal trajectory or not. So remember in our path planning algorithm, um, when we did before, we had, um, we had our A star, so I can run it again from last time. Uh, 
Google search. This is from last time. So it's called greedy search. This is still A star. Oh, this is greedy search. Sorry. So we had, well, this isn't good enough. So, so this is our greedy search going to the greedy algorithm to grow. But we, and we didn't like this, right? We wanted it to go to the optimal path to the goal. But if this was our search graph for the Queen's problem, do we care that it, that it found this funky path, or, or are we happy? <coughs> yeah. What is the Queen's problem? Oh, the end Queen's problem. So yes, I should define the problem. That's good. So um, this is a problem from the book, so some of you may have seen it. It's also used in your, problem, in your homework for, for this week, which is going to come out uh, after class. So how many of you guys have ever played chess? About two-thirds of you. So um, this is a chess board. So there's eight by eight. And a queen in chess can move in any direction uh, as many squares as it wants. So like this queen can, in, in, in sort of one chess move, it can go all the way up here, all the way, any of these squares, any of these squares, any of these squares any of these squares, and any of these squares. And the, the queen's problem, it's a toy problem, so, so for some reason you have eight queens. And I guess it could happen in chess if you had like all your pawns promoted or something. And what you want is to find a configuration of the chessboard so that none of the queens are attacking any of the other queens. So here, um, so, so, so here this queen and this queen are attacking each other. Um, but these other queens, this queen isn't attacking anybody else. And, and see, if you just follow all the directions, there's no other queen in, in that um, direction. So, so, and, the, and so what we want to just find is a configuration of this world where we have a queen on each chess square where no queen is attacking any other queen. So do we care about the path to the goal in this problem? So if we can imagine our search space look like this, here's our greedy search from last time. Um, so, so, so here, this is a 2D space. We can pretend that each of these nodes is some configuration of our queen space, and it gets to the goal. So do we care that we went this, this long way instead of this short way? Yeah? I mean, I guess that kind of represents the thought process of it, in which case, no, we probably don't care. Yeah, we probably don't. I mean, we, maybe we care because we don't want to not think for a very long time. But once we have the answer, we don't, we don't, we don't care. And the other thing to think about here is, like, if we did run A star, so let me switch this back to A star. Um, greedy search dot pi. Uh, there it is. So here's our thought process with A star. We kind of did this extra exploration over here, and then we figured it out, we did the right thing, and we went up. And we actually found the shortest path to reach the goal. But if we don't really care about finding the shortest path, this is just all wasted work, <coughs> right? So, so if a greedy algorithm would get us to the goal anyway, then, then, then we maybe could do even better than our informed search algorithm in terms of how many nodes we have to explore to get to the goal. So these greedy algorithms that, that we'll talk about today, hill climbing and, and simulated annealing, they're, they're, they kind of feel a little creepy because they're not guaranteed to find the optimal algorithm. And they can be really tricky to, to get working. But they're really, really powerful. And a lot of the coolest stuff in AI, um, and it, which we'll talk about in this semester, and, and sort of as you, as you take more computer science classes and stuff, a lot of the coolest stuff in AI is based on tricks that refine how these greedy algorithms do their, do their thing. Um, so we're going to talk today about two specific ones. One is the hill climbing algorithm, and the second is simulated annealing. So hill climbing is, is pretty similar to our greedy algorithm from before. But we're going to do it, and we're going to implement it again without. So, so last time we had a greedy algorithm with the whole priority queue thing. We're going to implement it without the PQs. Did you say something, Pat? Yeah. OK. Excellent. Uh, if anybody is upstairs, by the way, there's still more seats down here. So feel free to come down. <laughs> Join the party down here. Um, OK. So, um, so here's the pseudocode for hill climbing. And the other thing we can talk about with um, this queen's problem, to, to do hill climbing, what you need to do <coughs> is have some kind of notion of value. So this is, a, this is supposed to be, this, this algorithm is almost deceptively simple. All we're doing is we have our current state, so that's, our, that's the make node thing here. And then we look at all the successor nodes. We have some kind of cost or value function that says how good our successors are. And we pick the best one, and that's it. So, so it was like, like our, in our 2D space, it was just pick the one that's the closest to the goal and hope that everything works out. 
and maybe it won't work out. Maybe we'll get stuck, but we're just gonna um, we're just gonna do it. So, so let's try to implement this in the Queen's problem. So this slide here is showing an uh, I must have knocked it. Okay, but if people, it, so if the mic was out, I, a couple of times I, I um, suggested there's more space down here, so if people want to come downstairs, um, there's there's a, there's like three or four seats, so, and there's a bunch in the back as well. Okay, so hill climbing. So the first thing we need, and this is almost the, like like the the is to define the state space, and defining the state space. In code, like like from this hand wavy thing where I like waved my hands about the cost function and stuff, to code is often the most work of, of implementing one of these algorithms. Um, it's the hardest part. It's the trickiest part. There's lots of different ways, and there's really not good principled ways to say wh um, what's the best thing to do. You sort of have to use your intuition guided by your experience. Uh, so so I'm not going to actually code that up in in the class, but I'm going to show you what it looks like. So um, so first of all, let's just run it. Hill climbing mu.py. So what I'm showing you here is the state um, class. And it consists of a 5 by 5 matrix here. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And each of these is, is um, one of my chess cells. The 1 is, is where the queens are actually located. So does that make sense? I didn't make it very pretty. But um, the analogy between this is each of these cells is one of those matrix entries. And where the queen is, Queens are there's a one, and where there's not a queen, there's a zero. Um, and all I'm doing here is is making a state. I'm putting the queens at these different locations, and I'm printing it out. And when I run the program, you can see. So now let's write our hill climbing algorithm. So what should we do? Def hill climb. What should we take as input? Cost function or a value function? Yeah, cost function. So um, in terms of Python, the way that, we d that I did this is, so here's my class and queen state. And it takes as input the, the, no the end, so how big my grid is, and the locations of all, of all the queens. And there's a cost method here that tells me the cost of, of each square. So, um, so, so I'm not going to actually, this is kind of sort of the details. I want, I'm going to show you. I'm not going to actually code this up from scratch. Uh, but all we're doing is iterating through all the pairs of queens and then I wrote this attacks method that says if this queen is attacking that queen, then your cost is, one, is plus equals one, otherwise nothing. Okay? So if no queen is attacking any other queen, our cost will be zero, otherwise it'll be one. And then attacks is just some, just some, some sort of math, there's diagonals. So this is like the, the horizontals and verticals, and here's the diagonals. All right. So I have my cost function imbe embedded in my state. Yeah. Maximize the cost function or minimize the value function? Yeah, so this is, again, the yeah. sign stuff. So, so I like to think about cost functions. Um, you could also invert all the signs and, and minimize, okay. uh, maximize the value function or invert the signs and minimize the cost. And people will talk about both, and it can get really confusing, especially when, when the math gets hairy and, and stuff. Um, but in this implementation, this is in terms <coughs> of cost, so we're going to be minimizing our cost function. So what should our, our, our function take as input? Initial state, yeah. So I'm just going to print it because I like to run things a lot. So let's call it hill climb state. And this should basically be the same thing as before, print this state. 
All right, so now let's look back at our pseudocode from the book. And I'll pull up my Emacs buffer at the same time. Let's see. There we go. All right, so now what are we going to do? Somebody who hasn't raised their hand in class ever before. Or else I'll call on somebody. So what's the first line in the pseudocode say? Somebody just tell me in, in English what the first line in the pseudocode is doing. Who hasn't raised their hand before? Yes. Um, Thank so you. Set current to the initial state. Yeah, set current to the initial state. So, so what do you think that means we have to do in Python? What do you think that means we have to do in Python? Um, create variable yeah, current. create a variable called current. Yes. Current equals the input variable. So now what are we going to do? So what's the next line in the pseudocode? Somebody else who hasn't raised their hand before. Do you want, have you raised your hand before? You have? OK. Have you guys? Do you, ever, do you want to answer the question? While. While. Yeah, we want some kind of loop. Good. Thank you. So, so the loop is what's happening next. <laughs> In in uh, in the pseudocode. So while what? Yeah. Well, the <coughs> cost of current is not zero. Yeah, sure. While current dot cost is greater than zero. And now what are we going to do? Somebody just tell me in words. It's kind of up there in the pseudocode. Oh, yes. Find um, the neighbor has the lowest cost of the current. Yeah. And then make that the current. Yeah, so why don't we do a loop through all the, all the neighbor nodes? So, so to do that, we have to say for successor in current dot successors. And what I'm just going to do now is print the successor so we can see what that looks like. So let's go to our code and we'll run it. Infinite loop, yeah. <laughs> so does that make sense? Why, why is there infinite loop happening? Because we're not changing anything. Yeah, we're not changing our, our current. Um, I think it's still useful to do this, though. And we can print our cost, s.cost. I'm going to print a new line up here, too. So this is just showing me, if I, if I scroll back, all the successors with their costs. All right? So here's, um, here's a bunch of queens up here. And there's, there's eight conflicts detected here in this one. You can kind of see. Um, here's a four. Get it to scroll right. Here's a four. So this is sort of a, a better a better direction to go in. So it's useful when you're implementing these algorithms <laughs> to kind of see what the successors actually look like and figure out kind of where intuitively you want you want things to go. All right. So now let's get rid of our infinite loop. So what are we going to do? Here's our pseudo code. <coughs> if what? Yeah, successors value is greater than current value, but we're thinking about cost. So it's going to be if successors cost is less than current dot cost, what are we going to do? I heard somebody say it. You? Current equals s. Current equals s, yes. Current equals s. So let's try it. So we keep running forever. So this happened to me when I was implementing it too. Um, and this is. I don't know if it's useful to go into the trick of why, but we'll, we'll, we're going to do it anyway. So here, it's getting into this for state that we saw before. Um, but, but then it's kind of getting stuck in an infinite loop. It's never actually finding its way to 0. So does anybody want to hazard a guess as to why that might be happening? Yes? Is the local maximum where the current is better than all the neighbors? Yeah. Yeah, so, we're, so, so it's, like a, it's, a, it's a plateau, um, actually. So our current is the same as our next all of our neighbors. But, and, and we're just not exploring anymore. We're staying in our current node no matter what. So how can we get out of that? 
while still being in hill climbing. There's, there's kind of a little trick. Yeah? Yes, that's, that's a really good suggestion. So that's simulated annealing, which, which is exactly what we're going to do in the next algorithm. So this is almost, maybe it's too silly to, to do, but the, there's a trick we can do without even going to probabilities, which is we can say if it's less than or equal to, I think it still counts as hill climbing because we're not actually going into worst costs. We're just saying if it's the same cost, we'll let you make that replacement. That's going to that's gonna get us out of our infinite loop here. Um, and it actually, oh, wow, it didn't find all the way to the bottom. So it finds a two-cost solution here. Um, now, there is a zero-cost solution that I found when I was implementing this in, in the uh, in before lecture. But um, for whatever reason, it's, it's not finding that solution right now. So, so this is the, the case. Yes? It found it. I think it just didn't put it up. Oh, you're right. Good job. <laughs> yes. So what should we do? Return. <coughs> What's that? Yeah, well, let's return current, so result equals, let's be good software engineers. So here we go, print result, print result dot cost. Very good. Thank you. That was good. Um, so here we go. So, so it finds our, our zero cost solution. Um, we don't really know. I didn't really visualize you know, what path it was taking to get to the cost. Um, we can actually ask it, so I can keep track. I can do a little bit of bookkeeping and say, um, so i equals 0, and I'll just put i plus equals 1. At the end, we'll print i. Let me see. <coughs> Number of steps. <coughs> so we did five steps to do, to do it with this particular grid. <laughs> and we don't know. Maybe there's a way to do it with fewer steps. The other thing that, you c that we didn't really um, talk about was where the steps are coming from. So if we go to my n queens, I just gave you this successors def successors method. And this is the same one that was used in the problem set. So, so, what, um, so this is the code for it. Um, basically, what we're saying is a successor state can be attained by taking um, the, the location of, of any of the queens and just moving it by one square up, down, left, or right. Now, is that the only um, way we could get successor states? Can we think of another way to get successor mm -hmm. states? Diagonals? That, yeah, I could add in diagonals. Do I have to be limited to one um, expanding by one, or could I expand by more? Yeah? One way to get successors is to pick, the for each queen, the nearest optimal uh, result for moving mm -hmm. that particular queen. Yeah, so I could do, yes, I could put more stuff. I could put a lot of stuff in the way that I get my successor nodes. Um, the, the advantage of hill climbing search is that I didn't really have to do that much, that much stuff. I just sort of did something pretty simple. It's definitely not giving, like, you could imagine a much wider array of successors that I could come up with. Um, I could imagine being a lot smarter about the order that I came up with these successors. But the hill climbing kind of doesn't care. It's like, it's, it's going to do the right thing because we have a good cost function. It's going to do the right thing even if it is a relatively small set of successors, it doesn't change the state very much. Does that make sense? So this is one of the ways that you have to kind of um, change, or one of the ways that you have, one of, the, one of the sort of black magic things that you get to do when you, when you define these as new problems. Yes? So as long as hill climbing, the, the successors form a basis for their state space, it yeah. should be fine? Even, yes, so, so that's a really interesting question. So if it, 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 um, so, so there's sort of, uh, when you define the successors, if you're, if, if, so what, what you mean by basis is it's going to somehow, in the space of all the successors, if I could do exhaustive search, the right answer has to be there. What happens if the answer isn't there in, in the space of all my su successors? I'll never find it. Yeah, I'll, there's, yeah, I'll keep looping. I might, I might keep looping forever. I might put a timeout and, and stop looping. So a lot of these hill climbing algorithms, won't just loop till the cost is zero because you'll get into an infinite loop. They'll say, I'm going to loop until the cost is zero or a minute has passed or I've run a thousand samples or something and stop. But it won't find the answer one way or the other. Um, so so um, if you make the state space bigger so that it includes the right answer, then you have this, this dial, like it's bigger and bigger and bigger, and now your search problem is harder and harder and harder. So the the, um, the sort of one way that a lot of the, the magic happens when you define these problems 
is, is getting the right state space that's big enough to contain the right answer, but not so big that you're overwhelmed by the branching factor and, and by how things expand. Well, that, that, one, yeah. that one covers the entire Yeah, this one space. covers the entire state space. Just by not doing all the, all the moves. Yeah, so you, yes, so you could imagine like just generating all the possible successors like in one big thing. So this, this, this is gonna, gonna branch four times for each queen. You could imagine taking every queen and, and just having like a one-step search, right? Where our successors list contained all the possible configurations of those queens. Does that make sense? That would just be enumerating all the possible That would just be, yeah, we go back to enumerating all of the possible states. Does that sound like a great idea? What's that? It would work. It would work, but it'd be really slow. So, and it wouldn't really let us leverage our heuristic. So, so by choosing the successors in this kind of, we're going to just take our answer and try to change it a little bit, we're, 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 putting, we're putting our knowledge about how this problem is structured into play. Because we're saying, well, look, we know something about what states are better than other states, and we know something about how to change states in a way that, that this cost function kind of does the right thing. It, it kind of reflects how close we are in terms of, of steps in this state space to the, to the right answer. And, it, and, and this Queen's problem is constructed so, so that it always so it, so it kind of works on the right thing. Um, but we're going to talk uh, about problems where it doesn't always work and then the tricks you have to play to, to make it work. So now you had uh, this idea about what do we do when, when we're stuck in a local minimum. So, so what happens if I, in, in this hill climbing algorithm, if I get to a state, uh, like, is it always going to be guaranteed to find the right answer? No. So, so what could happen is I could get into some, some dead end, basically, where, you know, maybe, like, if you imagine I'm in a maze, like, right on the other side of the wall is the goal, but I can't teleport through that wall. Um, I'm in what's called a local minimum. And, and um, we're going to talk next about how we can recover from that situation. So, so the first thing I'm going to do is switch, yeah, question? <coughs> Yes, that's right. Yeah, so I'm not doing bookkeeping here to keep track. Uh, so let's go back to the hill climbing algorithm. I'm not doing bookkeeping here to keep track of which states I've already visited and, and stuff like that. And if you read in the book, there's algorithms. Um, one of them is called Beam Search, where I'll actually have multiple threads of exploration open. And I'll keep the best ones alive and close off the other ones. And I'll do the extra bookkeeping to, to avoid getting into that kind of infinite loop. But just to keep the code simple, because I'm doing it live in class, I, I'm, not, I'm not showing you that code here. Yeah. yeah Karthik? Uh, does this fall into informed search? Or this is informed search. Because we don't know which goal state, right? Like, we know the conditions for the goal, but we don't know which goal state. Right? Well, we are, it's informed search because, well, I mean, we, we sort of de implicitly defined our goal state here as the cost uh, is, is zero. But it's informed search because we're using the cost function to decide what nodes to explore next. Okay? So if we were doing uninformed search, we wouldn't have access to that cost function. So uh, a sort of version of this that would be uninformed, does anybody want to suggest a version of this that, that would be uninformed? Yeah? If you didn't pick the lowest cost or something like that. Yeah, you didn't have. That's right. So, for example, you could pick randomly. You could p randomly pick a successor and just kind of like a drunkard's walk kind of thing. Randomly explore the state space. And that might work really well, like especially um, in, in these high branching factor spaces. You might just get lucky. Um, you might not, though. So, so this is sort of the, um, the, the whole idea of informed search. And a lot of these methods rely on, on some way of incorporating the cost function to do a lot better. That was a good question. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to show you guys this um, version, this hill climbing thing in a uh, different domain, continuous domain, because it gives you a, a more intuitive sense of what the algorithm is doing. So hill climbing <coughs> curve.py. So here we are. This is like uh, a cubic function here. Um, and I'll show you the code for this. So hill climbing. So Here's my curve state action space. So I have a successors method and a cost method. So, so this, this thing here is my function that, that's um, giving me this, this curve. Um, my successors, I'm taking where I am, and I can go either 0.25 to the left, 0.25 to the right, 0.5 to the left, 0.5 to the right. Um, and, and those are my successors. And my cost is just the value of the function. So plotting what this, this looks like is, is this curve here, so here. 
And I put a bound, I think it's like a half and five, so I'm not allowed to go outside of that range. So this is showing, um, and then, and then um, what, what the hill climbing is going to do, hill climbing curved up. This is a very similar thing as before with some extra. So I implemented this in advance just to make sure we would um, get the graphical stuff in here. But this is basically the hill climbing we saw before where we're updating our cost um, based on, on the successors and then drawing what's happening. And then the raw input's going to, so every time I hit enter, it's going to do the next search node and plot it. So here we go. So what do you think is going to happen? So this is where I am right now. My successor states, I can go up a quarter, up a half, down a quarter, down a, down a half. Where would you, first of all, do you think I'm going to go left or, or right? Yeah, I'm going to go down the hill. What's that? What's that? Oh, well, I'm just trying to minimize my cost. Okay, yeah. yeah. All right. So let's, all right. So here it's telling me my, my cost down here. Um, so I'll hit enter, and this is showing our new state after having done that. So I've gone down a half. I'll just keep doing this. Do do do. Okay. So do we? So this is hill climbing, um, or I guess hill descending. Um, sorry the, for the sign inversion thing. Um, so I'm not that sorry though because it really happens a lot. So you have to just get comfortable with it. Um, so so do we like this? Is this a, is this the global optimum? No. What's that? Yeah, so we did better. We, we did better than, um, we, than, than our start state, but it's not the global optimum. And, and so now we're going to talk about how we can do better than this by um, implementing this simulated annealing algorithm. So let's talk about that. All right, so here's the, the, the um, pseudocode for simulated annealing. And the intuition was, was just what you said before. Do you want to say it again? Um, like some small probability, you'll, you'll go to some place that's worse than where you're at now. That's right. That's exactly right. So, so if we go back, so, so in, our, in, our, in our hill climbing, we just always, we just, we just put our blenders on. We're always going to go to a place with a lower cost, a higher value than where we were before. And what that means is we can get stuck in a local minimum. So, so a lot of the tricks to get around this are, are basically uh, summed up by saying sometimes, even though the cost is higher, we're going to go there anyway. And there's families and families of ways to say what sometimes means and how big the cost has to be and, and what it means to go there anyway and, 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 and all of that. And simulating annealing is, is one of the simplest ones it doesn't work all that well, as we'll see, but it's, it, this kind of algorithm has, has tons of applications, and we'll talk about them more as we, as we, uh, as we, get, as we get on into the semester. Um, so basically what this is doing, it looks a lot like the, the hill climbing. So we have this um, idea of a current node, which is where we are right now. And then um, if our current node, and then we select a random, so that now we're not doing this max, we're selecting a random successor of current. And if this node is better than the current node, then we're just going to go there. If it's not better, sometimes we're going to stay where we are, but sometimes we're going to go there anyway. So this, this probability thing says sometimes we're going to go there anyway. Okay? So going back to our, our sort of act rationally thing, this, this, this is putting a little bit more um, stuff into our scoring function. So, so, so the idea behind this probability um, thing that we're doing. We're doing this kind of funky thing, right? We're taking E, we're raising this, like why, you know, are we raising this delta T thing and dividing by the temperature um, to decide what to do. So, so does anybody want to, to, to tell me why they think this is, this is the right probability to accept or reject? Yes? Scale with the amount of time that's passed and how, how much work that's Right. That's good. So, so what is T? Temperature, yeah. So does it say in the yeah temperature? So that's my schedule. So the idea behind um, simulated annealing is that at the beginning of my search, I'm going to be like reckless. Like I don't, I'm, I'm going to try to explore the space wildly, um, and I'm going to be willing to take really big steps in a really negative direction because I don't really know anything about the space. I just want to explore and, and try to find a good place to be. Yes. So you're really cold at the beginning. You're really hot at the beginning. Would that make you a very would that make delta e over t very small? So it makes delta e 
really small. If this is if this is negative, then it makes it big. Oh, it's a negative. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Something yeah. So 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 this so so raising something to e to the negative something is like a cheap trick for turning any number into a probability. Okay. So so we're going to talk about like what probability like we're going to talk about the mathematics of probability and uncertainty and quantifying this formally in the next um, chunk, uh, which is, a, is about uncertainty. Um, but, but what this, this is really is, is a, is a hack. Okay? So, so they're basically saying, here's this delta E, and I'm going to do some mathematical tricks to raise it to the negative something. And all it's really doing is, is forcing the resulting number to be some number between 0 and 1. Okay? It's not really... Uh, you know, a, a very principled thing to do in, in, in some sense. Because I'm just picking up my cost, like wherever my cost came from, I don't really know where it came from. And I'm somehow converting it into, just by, by doing this mathematical trick, I'm forcing it to be between 0 and 1 and getting a probability. And then I'm making decisions based on this probability. It's kind of scary. Mm -hmm. um, like, like, what if my cost doesn't really reflect my belief about where, about, about, about where things are? Is that going to be mean this algorithm is going to do a good thing? Yeah, it might not do the right thing. Um, but it's it's kind of nice too because you can you don't you it you can even though like this doesn't seem like uh, the sort of most principled thing you can do it, it works as I said really well and there's and we'll talk more about more principled ways to do this general trick. All right. So let's go to the code. So I have here. Um, the function calls and stuff. So I have it kind of set up, partially set up, so we can just do like the inner inner block of stuff. So our simulated annealing um, has has our a bunch of drawing code, um, our curve state space. So this was the the same thing we saw before for the for the hill climbing. Um, some drawing code and then this anneal method, def anneal. So here's the anneal method. Um, this is just plotting code. Here's my temperature. And here's, here's my loop. I'm just going to loop forever um, in this thing. So I'm going to run it so we can see what it does right now. All right. So if I hit enter, it's, it's doing nothing, right? So what do you think we're going to, what do you think is going to happen? Are we going to stay in our same state or are we going to move somewhere? Stay. stay. Yeah, we're just going to stay in our same state. And here each time I'm printing out the temperature. So I've just configured the temperature to go down by point, point 0.01 each time step. And tuning, there's like no right way or wrong. I guess there is a right way because it's whatever works the best. There's not, you kind of just make up the, te the temperature schedule. You, 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 you get the best results, the most accurate results, if you decrease it slowly over a long period of time. But then, of course, it takes a longer time to converge. Um, and, and then this is showing my current x value and my current cost up there as I go. All right. OK, so now let's. Um, put some code in here to do, do the algorithm. So what do you guys think we should do? I got the pseudocode in the background. So, so we have our temperature, T equals schedule sub i. That corresponds to this line right here. What's the next line? What's the next thing we're going to do? Here's some whispers. Yes? Yeah, so if T equals zero, then return current. Yes. All right, so now what are we going to do? What's the next line? So in this case, do we not stop even if current the cost gets to zero? Cur yes, yeah, so this is a, a decision you can make okay. as you implement the algorithm. So it, just to, for illustration, we're not going to stop because we're going to see, like when I was testing this, like we'll find that it gets sometimes gets to a low cost and then leaves because it's looking for a better Solution and I and we won't be like we will not be saving the history, so it'll just that'll just be sad for the algorithm. Um, in general, you'll want to save the lowest, the best values you found globally, <coughs> and we'll talk about those tricks next. So, so what are we going to do next? What's the next line in our pseudocode? Yes, so next equals, um, so what do I, I want to do? I want to say random.sample from current.successors. 
What is that? Random dot choice. Yeah. Thank you guys. No. Look. Random dot choice current dot successors. Oh, I had to. It's just. It's. It's. It's going to work. I have to print out next. All right. So actually, what I'm going to do is one more thing with next. I'm going to draw it. So I'm going to copy that code for my. And I'm going to call it successor just because next is a reserved road in Python. Successor. Let's give that a shot. So here it's drawing th that plus up there is drawing the next. So 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 random dot choice is a way to sample randomly. Yeah. It's just a method that comes with Python to sample randomly from successors. So what what's that? Because Python has stuff. Like that. Yeah, Python has stuff like that. <laughs> um, uh, that's, that's why I like doing this in code as opposed to pseudocode, because Python makes it still pretty close to, <laughs> to what the pseudocode is. All right, so, so now when I hit enter, so here's my code, I'm just going to print out next and plot it. So, so, um, so this green cross is showing, if you, everybody can see the green cross, it's showing the next thing that it's going to think. So what's going to happen when I press enter now? It may or may not move. Well, will it go anywhere? Uh, we didn't do no, anything. we didn't do anything. All we're doing is drawing our successors. It may or may not Yes, that's right. So our cross is going to be moving around. So let's try it. All right, so it's just going to sample randomly for my successor states. There's four of them. I can go 0.5 in either direction and 0.25 in either direction. So you can see that happening. Randomness, yay. Pseudo-randomness. <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right, so now I have my successor. I randomly picked a successor. <laughs> Now what do I need to figure out? Yes? Yeah, so what is the variable called in the pseudocode? Delta E. Delta E. <coughs> delta E. So I'm going to make my delta E, which is the difference between my successor cost and my current cost. Yeah, we're going to have to, I'll, I'll put the sign in the E, actually. So I think it's e most intuitive to say my current minus my successor and then put the negative sign in the, when I raise it to a powder. Um, but yes, yes, getting the signs right is important. So now what? Yeah? Yeah, less than zero. Then what? Yeah, current equals successor. All right, so now what is going to happen when I run? It's going to be like hill climbing. So are we going to accept this one or not? No, let's see. No. Oh, sorry. No. Are we going to accept this one? Yes. Are we going to accept this one? Yes. This one? No, 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 no. OK, we just re-implemented hill climbing. So this is the same bug we got before with our, with our hill climbing. So now let's try to, so now comes the magical fix. Um, so here's the fix. If delta E is greater than or equal to 0, let's just say, uh, yeah, that's right. That's much better. <laughs> yeah, so this is a, actually, this is a really good um, rule about programming. Every if should have an else. And if not, then suspect the bug. And if you think that it will never get to the else, you should, what you should do is raise an exception, because that'll just confirm to you that it never reaches that, that place. All right, so then um, we want to we we accept with this probability, right? So let's get the probability first. Probability equals, so I'm just going to write out this math.pow, math.e, delta e divided by load. Let's print it out, probability. All right, and this is where we need the negative sign, because we're doing costs instead of, instead of uh, values. All right, so now it's just printing out this probability uh, when we go up here. So here, we're, it's thinking about going up, and it's not, uh, so that first if statement, remember, so, so if we were doing hill climbing, would we accept this state? No, no we wouldn't. 
But now this is our probability that we just computed. It's 0.236. So, so what do we want to do? We didn't actually do it yet, so it's going to still do implement hill climbing. But what do we want to do with this probability? Yeah? I mean, I guess with roughly a 28% chance, we want to take this bad state anyway. That's right. Here. That's right. Yes. Um, so, so we want to, you, you know, rel and, and, and what we did is, is made it, what? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what we did is we tried to, to, to put into this probability, it's going to be bigger when our cost, it's going to be smaller when our cost is bigger. Okay. So by putting our delta E in the probability value, um, it's going to be smaller when the cost is bigger. So if, I, if we get lucky. Here, here's what, here we got. So, so, so this step is, is um, I guess the temperature is changing too. So I, I should have maybe prepared this a little bit more so you actually see it in action. But the into so so I won't actually show you because we're running a little bit short on time. But um, but you just sort of have to trust me because we're putting delta e in, in this probability. The the way that with the sign and all that stuff, we're basically saying we want that probability to be. Bigger when our air, when our when our distance our difference in cost is smaller, okay. And the other thing we want is as our as our, we want to reflect our temperature schedule. So our temperature schedule. I just I just made this up. I had to try a bunch to make it kind of do the right thing. Um, so I just had to start from two to zero and and go down point in point oh one increments. So as our temperature schedule as time passes, we're just going to be less and less willing to accept these jumps until the end when we we revert back to um, hill climbing. And, and just try to find the local minimum wherever we are. All right, so now what we're going to do, I'm, I'm just going to steal the code from my, my practice implementation here. So there's this um, binomial method that says, given this probability value, I'm going to return, give me a boolean, it's going to flip a coin, weighted by this probability. So, <laughs> um, and then if accept, all right. So I just added a little bit of code here. Do I have to implement, import it? It's, no. Oh, probability, <coughs> probability. All right. So this binomial method is, is, in, uh, is in the Python standard library. And all it says is return one sample from a, from a coin flip. So zero or one, weighted by this probability. So it's actually going to do the coin flip for me. Um, and then if it, if it returns true, I'm going to do my update. Yes, I think so. Yeah. All right, so now let's try. It's kind of heartbreaking to watch it, <laughs> to be honest. All right, so here we go. Um, it's it's going to, so, so this is, a, it's not even going to compute the probability here. So we're at the, the green, the red node, and we're thinking about going to the green node. Our cost is lower, so we're just always going to do it. Oh, sorry. All right, cost is lower, <coughs> always going to do it. All right, cost is higher, we're going to flip a coin. Okay, our weighted coin is 0.35, and we might do it, and we might not. We didn't do it. Oh. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, 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 see here. You can see the temperatures. This, this, this step is, was really big, and the and the, the cost difference was high. Here, the cost difference isn't so high, so our probability is higher. So this is sort of an example of of, of how this is reflecting the delta, the delta t, the delta e's. Um, so we did it. Whoa. And then we can just keep doing this. It's gonna, it's kind of, like I said, kind of heartbreaking. Oh, here we go. Oh. <laughs> All right, so now we're gonna, we, we found it kind of. We got over the hump. Oh. <laughs> so now you gotta kind of hope that the temperature. So now we're gonna go down. This is, this is almost perfect. <laughs> So we go way down here. So now to go up, so see, see to go up because our cost was so big, this probability of taking this is really low. We're <laughs> we might. I mean, you never know. Now, the thing is, my temperature is still high. So if I sit here and hit enter, we did go up. All right. Now, and, and, and we can just sort of keep going. Our probability will dance around. And we might actually get out. OK. This is a random algorithm, so it's not guaranteed to actually stay in this in this hole that it found. Oh, <laughs> so so 
so it kind of seems a little stupid, maybe. <laughs> Um, when you actually watch it bouncing around, when I was playing with this, like, like to get it to work this well, I had to tune the temperatures and, and kind of tweak how, how deep those pits were and stuff so that I would, so I would with, with high likelihood, when I ran it in class, you guys would actually see it go down into, into, the, into the, the pit and find the goal. Um, the thing is that, um, that this, so, so, so don't let this, this, the silliness of this approach fool you. Because it's actually used in a lot of really interesting applications. Yes. Did you use the, 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 the kneeling, the, this method to find good parameters? I didn't, but <laughs> um, that's a kind of funny joke about machine learning is that you yourself are, machine, are, are become the AI algorithm and the agent. So we've got five more minutes, guys. Um, and what I wanted to do was kind of um, counterpoint the, the simple, I don't know, simplicity, but the silliness of what this algorithm is actually doing in this very small state space and show you some examples of domains where it's, it's um, versions of this, fancier versions with more tricks and stuff like that, have had very powerful results. So um, and there's a bunch of tricks you can do, random restarts, changing the temperature schedule, keeping track of your history so, you never, so if you did leave that lowest cost point, you can go back to it. Um, so you're going to do this uh, for one of your products. This is showing localization of a robot. And what it's doing is, is these blue lines are showing the sensor readings. And the red, line, the red dots are showing different hypotheses that the, this algorithm has about where it thinks the robot is in the map. And the green is the, is the best hypothesis. So at the beginning of this, it, it thought it was up here, but really the robot's down here. And now it's kind of localized. It thinks it's here. A bunch of it thinks it's, it's over there. And this, this is a particle filter. And it's not exactly simulated in alien, but like the idea of taking random samples and updating them and, and, and doing it with fancy math, but like doing this, this, this basic algorithm is what everybody uses on their robots, the Google card and stuff, to, to do localization. Um, this is an example from computational linguistics. So, so there's something called Gibbs sampling, which you use to train these models, to train a topic model. So you give, they gave this model a bunch of articles from the journal Science, and they said, go with, with our model. And they use a, a, a version of this forward sampling algorithm where you're looking for low points in a very big space. And what it comes up with after, after training is it figures out that there's a topic called genetics. And this topic is associated with words like human, genome, DNA, genetic, gene, sequence, molecular. And there's another topic called evolution, which is associated with life, origin, evolutionary species, organisms. And what's that? <laughs> and two, yeah. So we get these weird things. Well, well we're talking. So, so this is an example of our local minima, and some kind of funky things are happening here. But so, 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 so the, these sort of deployed algorithms that people use for a lot of really important um, for a lot of, of applications suffer from these local minima. That's why two is there. However, they're they're doing good things too. So, so, um, and this is useful for making computers that can automatically process text. It's used in search engines. It's used in machine translation, and speech recognition. Um, and then um, another example was from the the robot we showed at the beginning of class. So this is um, showing an example of like the the path <laughs> that you might get from one of these algorithms, where it's kind of curvy. There's two in the in the in the topic model. It's not the A star path. But it is a path. So, so here, it's, it's um, you know, we could do the A star when we're doing 2D locomotion. But if we go to um, our robot, um, there's actually lots of different paths. This is like an, an overlay of all the different paths we could do <laughs> of our robot to actually come and, and grab the cup. I'll sh and I'll sort of finish with a video of this. Let's see. Um, here's one of them just in practice. That's found from this RRT algorithm. Again, sampling and updating our samples. <laughs> He's dancing. It's weird. It's a local optimum. It's not the global optimum. But at the end, but at the end, we actually got to a path that achieved the goal. Now, there's a very recent paper that, that uses this similar approach. It's called RRT star, just like uh, A star. That's why it's named A star, where it's finding now the global optimum. So you'll see the, the path is much nicer. But it's still using the sampling kind of algorithm. So, so the, like the modern cutting edge research result is merging this with A star to get rid of some of those um, two things. So have fun in your problems, in your projects, and I'll uh, see you on Thursday. The dancing robot was more fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, my office hours are right now after class. I changed them from Thursday to Tuesday. Okay. Hi. Yeah.
present. Yeah. Uh, for example, if you take a heuristic where yeah. you are checking the, uh, the adjacent uh, numbers distance. The which? Adjacent numbers distance. Yes. For example, in the gold state, yes. uh, the distance of 2 from 1 is 1 and 3 from 1 is 2 mm -hmm. or like 3 from 2 is 1 mm -hmm. and this so on. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to end up in that particular state, mm -hmm. like it can be just the flip of mm -hmm. those states. So do you call that as admissible or consistent? I think maybe we can go up to my office and we can draw it on the whiteboard okay. and then we can sure. work it out. Sure. Okay. Sorry, oh, you were first, uh, yeah. Where is your office? Uh, 445. Okay, great. Yeah. Thanks. I have seen this before. Okay. Uh, <coughs> I mean, I have um, extra time on exams. Okay. The only thing that's going to be relevant for this Okay. Course. All right. And I'll email you, you before, okay. you know, put it on the exam. Okay. Sounds good. Great. Thanks, Thanks for being in the course and answering um, questions. Yeah. Hey. Um, so I recently joined the course. Yep. Um, I tried to sign up to the EdX yes. um, site, but it said the registration had ended. Yeah. yeah. Are you going to turn? Yeah, turn it back on. Just leave it on for everybody. I think there's not a, unless you feel like there's a policy or something. I mean, the only thing that could yeah. happen is people could make multiple accounts and try the homework multiple times. Oh, I see. I don't think people will do that. Huh. Hopefully not. I can, I can re-up and out. You mentioned that there's a already been a homework that Yes. Completed. Yes. Um, yeah. Can I make that up, or do I just like take that as a loss? Um, I would. That would require extending the due date for everybody. That being said, we're dropping the lowest homework. Oh, okay. okay. We're dropping the lowest homework.